Imagine a sky filled with dark clouds from a battle that rages beneath it. Visualize arrows and bullets flying at high speed, coupled with the cry of men struck by death. This scene portrays one of the most captivating events in Native American history, the legendary Battle of the Little Bighorn. This 1876 clash between the United States Army's 7th Cavalry Regiment, led by General George Armstrong Custer, and a coalition of Lakota Sioux, Cheyenne, and Arapaho tribes, led by Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, stands as an enduring symbol of both triumph and tragedy in American history. However, this historical battle is laced with myths, misconceptions, and controversy, making it a subject of enduring debate. That is why, in this video, we will carefully examine what led to the war, the events that took place during the war, and of course, the aftermath of the war, which marked a significant start of a new era for the Native American tribes. While you're waiting to absorb all the fascinating details of the Battle of Little Bighorn, kindly like this video and subscribe to this channel for more content on the rich histories of Native America. Let's get right into it. It all started with the rather gradual movement of the United States towards the West from the late 18th century into the 19th century, which led them to infiltrate the lands of indigenous Native American tribes slowly. The promise of fertile land, abundant resources, and potential wealth through agriculture and trade lured many Americans westward. A new slogan, Manifest Destiny, was created to support this movement. Even the 11th U.S. President, James K. Polk, was known to actively use this slogan to express his support for this westward expansion. In the year 1803, President Thomas Jefferson bought the Louisiana Territory from France to kickstart the westward move. Apart from the desire to grow, Jefferson was concerned that the United States might lose access to the port of New Orleans or face increased restrictions on its use. What's so special about this port? The port of New Orleans, located at the mouth of the Mississippi River, was of great economic importance to the United States. It served as a crucial outlet for the products of the American Midwest, particularly agricultural goods like grain and tobacco. Control of New Orleans means American farmers could efficiently transport their products to markets in the East and overseas. And, of course, that would greatly boost the economy of America. Before the purchase, France was facing serious conflicts with Europe. Selling the vast land area was an opportunity to raise money to fund the ongoing military campaigns and avoid a potential conflict with the United States. Not long after, Jefferson's envoys, James Monroe and Robert Livingston, negotiated the Louisiana Purchase for $15 million, effectively doubling the size of the United States. After this purchase, thousands of Americans migrated to Oregon for greener pastures. This movement continued until 1848, when gold was discovered at John Sutter's Sawmill in Coloma, California. The lure of instant wealth attracted an estimated 300,000 fortune seekers, known as 49 ERs, to California in search of gold deposits in riverbeds and mines. However, this frenzied migration greatly affected the indigenous Native Americans. As settlers moved westward, they encroached upon Native American lands, leading to disputes over territory and resources. To make matters worse, the U.S. government pursued policies of Indian removal, such as the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which forcibly relocated tribes from their ancestral homelands to designated areas often far from their original territories. One of the most notorious examples of forced relocation is the Trail of Tears, which occurred in the 1830s when the Cherokee Nation was forcibly moved from Georgia to present-day Oklahoma, resulting in the deaths of thousands due to exposure and disease. In 1874, the discovery of gold in the Black Hills of South Dakota, spurred by a mining expedition led by General George Custer, had captured the attention of the U.S. government. The next year, President Ulysses S. Grant ordered that all Sioux people vacate the Black Hills of South Dakota and Wyoming by the end of the following January. These actions violated the terms of the 1868 Treaty of Fort Laramie, which had explicitly acknowledged the Black Hills as Sioux territory. However, some brave natives resisted this gruesome removal by retaliating with a fight. Sitting Bull, a respected Hunkpapa Lakota chief and spiritual leader, was among those who resisted birthing the famous Battle of Little Bighorn. General George Armstrong Custer was a prominent figure in the Sioux War. His military career and reputation were marked by audacity, charisma, controversy, and tragedy. 
Custer's early military career began with the outbreak of the Civil War at 1861. Despite graduating from the United States Military Academy at West Point with the worst grade in his class and earning the title of the GOAT, he displayed excellence on the battlefield. He demonstrated his skills as a cavalry officer, earning several promotions for his daring exploits on the battlefield. One of Custer's most significant achievements during the Civil War was his role in the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. He led his Michigan Brigade in a heroic and successful cavalry charge against Confederate forces, helping to secure a crucial Union victory. This action earned him praise and recognition, leading to further promotions. His distinctive appearance further solidified Custer's reputation. He was known for wearing a flamboyant uniform that included a red necktie, a wide-brimmed hat, and a buckskin fringe jacket. This attire and his long blonde hair contributed to his iconic image. However, Custer's military career was not without its controversies. He was known for his aggressive and impulsive style of leadership, which sometimes led to clashes with superiors and fellow officers. Additionally, his tactics were occasionally criticized for being reckless and overly ambitious. Despite these controversies, Custer's charisma and battlefield successes endeared him to many in the North. He became a celebrated figure and was often featured in the press. His popularity extended beyond military circles, making him a recognizable and glamorous figure in American society. Custer's experience in cavalry warfare and his reputation as a dynamic leader caught the eye of military authorities. He was appointed the commanding officer of the newly formed 7th Cavalry Regiment, tasked with maintaining order and protecting the expanding interests of the United States in the Western territories. Ultimately, he was tasked with leading the U.S. to victory in the upcoming Sioux War. Another big name in this war was the Sitting Bull, whose Lakota Sioux name was Tatanka Iotanka. He was a prominent Native American leader known for his significant influence among the Lakota Sioux during the late 19th century. One of the most significant aspects of Sitting Bull's influence was his role as a spiritual leader. He was known for having powerful visions and dreams. In 1872, he had a vision of soldiers falling into his camp like grasshoppers from the sky, which he interpreted as a premonition of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, a vision that proved accurate. Another prominent figure who played a huge role in this war is Crazy Horse, whose Lakota name was Tasunka Witko. He remains one of the most enigmatic and revered figures in Native American history. Crazy Horse was renowned for his military brilliance and unconventional tactics. He preferred hit-and-run guerrilla warfare, utilizing the mobility of his forces on horseback to strike his enemies swiftly and then disappear into the vast plains. His strategies were instrumental in several Lakota Sioux victories against U.S. forces, including the Battle of the Rosebud in 1876. Now that you know the key players in this historical battle and the events leading to it, let's take a tour of the events that took place during the battle. Before we move any further, please like this video and hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so. Despite the government's warnings, groups of Lakota and Northern Cheyenne Native Americans and a smaller contingent of Arapaho chose not to adhere to reservation boundaries. As spring arrived in 1876 and the hunting seasons commenced, many indigenous people abandoned their reservations and united under the leadership of Sitting Bull. His followers, steadily increasing in number, established their camp along the Little Bighorn River, a tributary of the Bighorn River, in the southern region of Montana Territory by the end of June. During that spring, following the directives of Lieutenant General Philip Sheridan, three separate military columns converged upon Lakota Territory, intending to subdue the rebellious indigenous groups. Firstly, advancing eastward from Fort Ellis, situated near Bozeman, Montana, was a formidable column commanded by Colonel John Gibbon. Simultaneously, a second column under the leadership of General George Cook embarked from the south, departing from Fort Fetterman in Wyoming Territory. Meanwhile, on May 17th, Brigadier General Alfred H. Terry set out westward from Fort Abraham Lincoln, overseeing the Dakota Column, of which the bulk consisted of Custer's renowned 7th Cavalry of roughly 700 men. Terry's strategic plan was to dispatch Custer and the 7th Cavalry to pursue Sitting Bull's trail, which led into the Little Bighorn Valley. Terry envisioned a coordinated assault, with Custer positioned to strike the Lakota and Cheyenne from the south, thereby driving them toward a smaller force deployed further upstream along the banks of the Little Bighorn River. By the morning of June 25th, 
Custer's scouts had successfully located Sitting Bull's village. Custer intended to shift the 7th Cavalry into a tactical position to facilitate a dawn assault on the village the following day. However, when a few stray Indian warriors unexpectedly spotted a handful of 7th Cavalrymen, Custer assumed they would hasten to alert their village, potentially causing the residents to scatter in response to the impending threat. Fearing that the already laid strategy might not work out, he decided to resort to his reckless side and drafted a new strategy without waiting for instructions from his superior. In a bold move, he divided his 7th Cavalry Regiment into three distinct battalions, each assigned a specific role in what would become a pivotal moment in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Custer entrusted the first part of his strategy to Major Marcus A. Reno, who led three companies. Reno's mission was to launch a direct charge into the heart of the Native American village to create chaos. Simultaneously, Captain Frederick W. Benteen led another group of three companies, positioning them to the south. They aimed to cut off any potential escape route for the Native American forces in that direction, effectively blocking their path. General Custer himself led the remaining five companies of roughly 300 men, choosing to personally spearhead the assault from the northern flank of the village. He aimed to launch an assault on the rear of the Native American camp, where he presumed that women and children would likely be gathered. Custer calculated that he could exploit the warrior's protective instincts by targeting this vulnerable point. He likely believed that if the warriors believed their families were under direct threat, there was a strong likelihood they would abandon the battle to rush to the aid of their loved ones or even consider surrendering. However, this beautifully crafted strategy would end up being Custer's worst mistake, costing him even his life. He greatly underestimated the intelligence and numerical strength of the natives. Custer's decision to split his regiment into multiple groups prevented them from providing each other with timely support during the battle. Of a truth, this little disorganized army had no chance against the over 1,000 ferocious Native American warriors. Major Marcus Reno led his detachment of about 140 soldiers across the Little Bighorn River, approximately two miles south of the Native American camp. This move was intended to launch an attack on the southern end of the encampment. Reno's sudden arrival took the inhabitants of the village by complete surprise. Many were blissfully swimming in the river due to the scorching hot weather. Word soon reached the village of the unfriendly arrival of soldiers, and as Reno's troops advanced toward the southern end of the camp, they quickly encountered resistance. Hundreds of Native American warriors armed with rifles, bows, arrows, and charms emerged to confront them. This included Crazy Horse, who quickly grabbed his weapons and charms of protection before galloping with his horse to the skirmish scene. Reno's forces, now dismounted, formed a skirmish line to engage the warriors. However, they were heavily outnumbered and faced the imminent threat of being outflanked and surrounded. Recognizing the dire situation, Reno returned to a position of relative cover and better protection. He led his men to a line of trees along the riverbank. Despite this defensive move, Reno's troops suffered casualties from the intense fighting. The Native American warriors maintained their pressure, making Reno's detachment difficult and dangerous. Major Benteen, upon hearing the sound of gunfire from Reno's positions, quickly moved to join Reno's weakened troops. Soon, Native American warriors hid in the trees, and Major Reno told his soldiers to run away again, but they were running in panic this time. Lakota and Cheyenne warriors chased after them, shooting them from close up, pulling some off their horses to finish them off with clubs, knives, or lances. The soldiers who managed to cross the river dug holes in the dusty ground to hide and shoot at their pursuers. However, during this chaos, 38 soldiers lost their lives. The survivors, which included Reno, Benteen, and their soldiers, kept digging in a fierce survival attempt. The opposing sides kept opening fire on each other until the Lakota warriors had to change their tactics by using bows and arrows. By evening, each side began to tire out, and the Lakota warriors were forced to disperse due to reduced supplies but it was clear who the winner of the battle was. On the other hand, General George Custer and his troops advanced toward the valley of the Little Bighorn River, unsure of their predicament. They arrived at a ridge north of Major Reno's position not long after. This place would later be known as the Last Stand Hill. Custer then decided to halt his troops and take a little break in preparation for the battle, which they had poorly planned for. In a split second, they were surrounded by a sizable force of Native American warriors. Estimates suggest the Native American force outnumbered Custer's men 
by at least 10 to 1. They were both outnumbered in men and guns. The Lakota and Cheyenne warriors were armed with the most sophisticated rifles, such as Henry repeating rifles, Winchester Model 1866 repeaters, and Colt and Smith revolvers. With their overwhelming numerical advantage, the Native American warriors encircled Custer's men, effectively cutting off any escape routes. The battle intensified around 4.30 p.m. as the Native American warriors closed in on Custer's position. Facing a relentless attack from all sides, Custer's men were picked off one by one, and they fought fiercely, but were ultimately overwhelmed. By 6 p.m., just an hour and a half after the battle had escalated, every member of Custer's party had been killed. It was already too late when General Terry came onto the scene. An overwhelming number of mutilated bodies and General Custer's naked, lifeless body greeted them. He was found naked with bullet holes in his chest and one in his temple. There are no actual records or eyewitness accounts of how exactly he died. Although several speculations range from suicide to brutal murder by the native warriors, only an estimated number of 38 Lakota warriors were killed throughout the battle, which is significantly low. So, what happened after this historical battle? Let's find out. Custer's last stand was not just a significant military defeat for the U.S. Army. It also symbolized Lakota resistance and their determination to protect their ancestral lands and way of life on the Great Plains. The U.S. government responded to Custer's defeat with urgency and determination. They recognized that the battle indicated a formidable challenge to their authority in the region. Colonel Nelson Miles was then appointed to lead a vigorous winter campaign against the Lakota and other Plains tribes, primarily subduing what they called hostiles. The following winter campaign marked harsh weather conditions and relentless pursuit by U.S. forces. The strategy was to wear down the Lakota's strength. Despite their initial victory, the Lakotas faced an overwhelming U.S. military force, along with significant depletion of resources. As the days passed, they always ran low on food, water, and shelter. Sitting Bull led a faction of his people across the border into Canada to evade U.S. pursuit. Crazy Horse, another revered Lakota leader, eventually surrendered to U.S. authorities. Tragically, he met a grim fate while under arrest at Fort Robinson, as he was killed the following year. One of the most significant consequences of the Lakota Sioux's defeat at the Battle of the Little Bighorn was the U.S. government's seizure of the Black Hills, a region of immense spiritual and cultural importance to the Lakota. Shockingly, the Native Americans received no compensation for losing their sacred lands, fueling long-standing grievances and contributing to enduring tensions between the Lakota Sioux and the U.S. government. The Battle of Little Bighorn highlighted the importance of gathering accurate intelligence about the enemy's strength and position before engaging. That lack of detailed intelligence contributed to Custer's defeat. With that in mind, the U.S. military emphasized gathering information about enemy forces and terrain. This historical battle showcased the effectiveness of Native American warrior tactics and strategies. Rather than underestimating their adversaries, the U.S. military began to respect and adapt to the skills of indigenous warriors, recognizing that they were formidable opponents. To date, Custer's last stand inspires modern Native American activists and leaders who advocate for tribal sovereignty, cultural preservation, and social justice. Thanks for watching patiently till the end. In the comment section below, kindly share what you've heard about this famous battle. Also, don't leave without liking this video and hitting the subscribe button for premium access to the rich histories of Native America. Till next time!